Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. The days are getting shorter and a bit colder, but there is still plenty to do out doors. So if you do any form of gardening or landscaping, our experts are here to share some fall tips. Joining me as they do each month are UVM horticulturist Leonard Perry and the director of UVM Plant Diagnostic Clinic, Ann Hazelrig. Great to see you. Thank you Good to be for back coming friend. in again. <laughs> and so Leonard, you heard from a viewer. Uh, I had did, a, had a uh, question. from Hoopy in Morrisville yeah. about her house plants and so can do things indoors as well as outdoors now. It's a great time right. to make sure those house plants are ready for winter if they need dividing, fertilizer, uh, so forth. If they're outside, you know, Obviously, bring hopefully them bring them in before yeah. the frost or <laughs> you've lost them already. Yeah. Um, but I uh, brought an African violet because that was one of the questions that uh, Hoobie had was how to <coughs> divide those. Well, mine, believe it or not, had two plants like this in this pot. Mm, so right. I think it needed dividing. It was, I'd been meaning to for months. So I said, finally, got to get around to it. So you gently, you know, hold your hand and take it out, make sure it's well watered. And then mm -hmm. look and see where the plants are. Usually these African violets make up two or three plants and you could see there were two stems. So then you get a sharp knife, serrated. I use it like a planting knife that's got a little serration on it and gently just kind of uh, cut right down through so you make sure that half the roots are on either side and then just repot it in a nice potting mix. Um, keep it, you know, pretty low. Hopefully the stem's not too big. If it's gotten too big, then you're kind of in trouble because you either have to have a deep pot to pot it deeper uh -huh. or you have to um, basically cut it off and try to root that top part, Ooh. take most of the leaves off. Do you use root stuff if um, you do if you um, do that? I've got just, one that's pretty big probably now. Probably just <laughs> set it in, but you know, okay. just leave about an inch or right. so, um, cut the rest of the bottom off, uh, take most of the leaves off so right. it's not, and then put it in like a plastic bag out of direct ah. sun to keep that moisture in because it obviously has no roots, right. you know, for about a month or six weeks until it, it starts to root in. Right. But something like this, hopefully, and mine's in a north window, it, it likes that. Um, don't overwater it, but uh, and use um, lukewarm water. It's one of the huh. worst things you can do with violets. You can oh. get water on the leaves, but not cold water. That'll right. spot the leaves. So that's, that's even if you're not really repotting, um, make sure, especially wintertime, it's with all your house plants. Yeah. You really turn yeah. the faucet on, it comes out cold. You don't think about it, but you're really stunning the plants. That's really a, that's a really good tip because I try not to wet the leaves yeah. on, on, on the African violet. So, and I, you know, I had a I had a question for you, and it was great that you identified this. I had took a picture of a plant that is invading my little vernal stream bed, and it's even it even seems to be taking over the purple loosestrife, which I've been pulling out. Um, what? Is yeah, it? that's a um, related to the fireweed, the epilobium okay. genus, epilobium, and it's a hairy willow herb, it's called. It's uh, fairly <laughs> tall, as yours, your picture you showed there with the pinkish it's got, flowers. It's got cute little flowers, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it, is, uh, it is like five it, or six it, feet tall. It's not a native. It came in from Europe probably in last cent uh, well, in the 1800s, either in ship's ballast or as an ornamental, and now just as you say, really grows and as you were saying, it's crowned out the purple loosestrife, which right. is an invasive plant. Uh, this is actually in some states like Massachusetts considered invasive oh, as okay. well, because it just really comes in. Uh, the problem with it, it spreads both by roots and by seeds. So if you want to yeah. enjoy the flowers, when they're through, you know, cut it back so they don't go to seed. That, that'll help there. Okay. But the roots, you just oh, have yeah. to keep digging out, but mm -hmm. you leave any little pieces, they'll reroot. It, it's really hard. And mm -hmm. if uh, you did want to use uh, herbicide on it, just make sure, mm -hmm. especially if it's an aquatic area, you yeah. really have to follow the label, make sure you use a product that's right. not going to damage the, the wetland. So that that's real real think iffy I have to do that. Cutting so. and digging to do. Yeah, I think <laughs> okay. so. And keep that. It may take a few years. <laughs> okay. So. okay. And and Anne, um, you have a, a couple of seasonal issues. Yeah, for us. I've I brought things in that growers have sent me recently. Right. So this first uh, slide is of a squash, a winter squash that somebody sent me, and it's got these corky growths on uh -huh. the outside, and. There oh, yeah. are diseases that can cause that, but we ruled that out by looking at things under the microscope. But what causes that, it's called edema. And what happens is when the air temperatures are cooler than the soil temperatures and the soil's wet, those protrub protuberances can form <laughs> on the squash. Those little um, bumps. Bumps, yes, <laughs> there, thank you, technical term. Um, but they're perfectly fine to eat, so yeah. it's okay. just a cosmetic thing. Okay, so it's not a big deal. And then there's yeah. there's there's another gourd that you have. That's yeah, very interesting. there's another one that I brought. Uh, don't uh, confuse it with uh, this pumpkin and squash that are being 
uh, grown now and bred for that warty appearance. Oh, this is so one called, good for Halloween. I know it's <laughs> called knucklehead. So they're, the breeders are actually breeding uh -huh. this wartiness into the the pumpkin. Right. So if there's a if there's a pumpkin that, you, that isn't that and and is getting those, should we worry about it? But again, no. it's just a no. It's thing. just the weather. And I was just going okay. to uh, also give another tip that if you do have orange pumpkins now this time of year, they should be turning orange. They really get damaged by cooler temperatures, anything uh -huh. below 50 degrees. So if you've got an wow. orange pumpkin, you might want to cover it at night or bring it in um, because it will it won't last as long. And we want them right. to last until. Halloween. Sure, sure. <laughs> so actually even bring them in. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Leonard, um, throughout the summer you mentioned this wonderful trip that you are taking people up to Montreal Botanical Gardens. Um, how was it? How did it go? Great. We had a great tour. Uh, two buses of people. Wow. Uh, all enjoyed it. Great weather. Um, lots to see up there. I always go up every year. Always get new ideas up there. New plants. Uh, combinations and the uh, Chinese lanterns are well worth seeing. Now this year I was a little surprised because the 20 or so years mm. I've been seeing uh, this was the same exhibit as they had last year. Oh. So if you saw it then you've seen it but if you haven't it's definitely worth seeing and uh, mm. we just saw it by day but you can see the colors are just really vibrant. This was a, a sea creature. Um, the theme was uh, relating back to the earliest compilation of myths and legends from China and uh, this was a, mm. a sea creature from that and uh, fishermen around there and uh, fish, uh, all lanterns. Um, and then you know, a basket boat made out of bamboo, in the background uh, sampans, and then just a close up to show some of the details you can see in these lanterns and these fishing people here and the fish. So they all Sweet. light up? Like uh, the they light, light up at night, yeah. Oh. Everything <laughs> all beautiful. lit from inside. It's beautiful at night. I've, been, I've yeah. done it, I've yeah. done it just once. Huh. But, and then you also, you know, what, what combinations of flowers and new flowers did you yeah, brought did a, you just did a few to show to just uh, show a about. lot of times they show outdoors but the first one I brought is of a tiger orchid which is in mm. the uh, that's one of my favorite exhibits all the orchids they have in there and this was actually a cultivar named after the botanic gardens Shoot. but just gorgeous some of these things you never see before the uh, black uh, blacky uh, sweet potato vine that's a newer annual in the back and yeah actually can buy it more now it's called angel wings it's a uh, related to dusty miller in that hoop in the background with begonias on it some, mm. some real innovative stuff you can see. Of course, a lot of just beautiful colors this year. Very vibrant with the red coleus and the French marigolds. A lot of marigolds this year, mm. Mm. Uh, which was interesting. Mm. And here, more marigolds along with kale, some impatiens, and these uh, impatiens on these little round balls stuck mm. uh, above the beds, which was just gorgeous. And the front entrance to the garden with, again, sweet potato vine and impatiens and coleus and uh, grasses and some elfin ears just changes dramatically each year. Um, here's one that I got an idea a few years ago from the gardens, I've been growing since dinosaur kale. Uh, very uh, mm -hmm. good to eat, but really attractive in the garden, the specimen or mast like that. And then um, a lot of, even the vegetables are very ornamental, mm -hmm. like here's the red and green lettuce. I thought it was great contrast. So it shows, gives you some ideas how you can really design your own garden. And this is one that was recently renovated. The water garden, we actually walk down on the level and can look in the beds. But the uh, nice thing about it this time is they actually built in a lot more beds that recirculate the water, purify the water. So using the plants in wetlands to purify the water. And they have a whole exhibit telling how that's done. Brilliant. So, yeah. Huh. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. How, how much fun. And it's still going on until It's still going on until the end of October. So if people want to get up and see the Chinese lanterns okay. here on until then. Probably avoid the weekends. Avoid the weekends can. and get tickets get in advance because okay. it is very popular. Good All right. tip. So, uh, so Anne, uh, the beautiful pictures, but we have <laughs> those things that we still have to watch out for. Yes, so right. what are some of those things? So we've got a disease on maples that um, causes concern among home gardeners. It's called uh, maple tar spot. Okay. And it's a leaf with a big black, those are fruiting bodies, the spores come up out of those, and it's common on red, silver, and Norway maples. And it causes a lot of concern, but it's a late season disease, there's nothing to worry about. Home gardeners can just rake those up and destroy them and maybe decrease the inoculum for next year. Okay. But it doesn't really hurt the plant much because it's so late in the season. But still destroying the leaves is a good thing. Yeah, that's okay. always a good thing. Um, then we have another, uh, uh, Norway, another maple um, issue called maple leaf cutter that we get calls about. It looks very bad again, but it's a, 
a late season problem, and it's um, a little insect that causes these mines uh, in the maple leaf, and it cuts a circle, and then eventually those circles drop out. Mm -hmm. So it looks pretty devastating. Yeah. But again, it's a late season pest. Raking and destroying the leaves might help, um, but it's cyclical. Some years are worse than others. Okay, and we have a, what's this next one? There we go. Oh, this was a cool. This was sent in by a gardener, Marilyn uh, McQuaid, and I asked her if I could use this for across the <laughs> fence because I think it's really cool. It's a parasitic plant called dotter, and it produces these yellow and orange sort of tendrils, and it's an annual, and it reproduces by seed, and the seed germinates in the spring, and it grows for about a foot. If it can't find a plant to invade, it'll die. But if it finds a plant, it invades the plant and sort of takes the nutrition from the plant. Wow, so you want to get rid of that. Yeah, you do. Yeah, okay. yeah so it's kind of a cool <laughs> And then we're weed. almost out of time, but I love that there are two caterpillars that maybe we should oh, look yeah, for Oh yeah, are, these are great. We've gotten uh, calls about both of these. This is a milkweed tussock moth, and this is common on milkweed. And yeah, it looks like a crazy thing. This is a hickory tussock moth. We see a lot of those on hardwoods right now. Uh, just, you know, kind of a curiosity, no yeah. need to control okay. either one of those. All right. Well, I can't, I can't believe our time is already <laughs> up. So, um, and some, how do people get more information and, and check in with yeah, your program? Yeah, Master Gardener Helpline is the first line of defense. Call them first. <laughs> okay, and there it is on your screen. <laughs> yeah. And, and Leonard, um, maybe what's going on on your website? Yeah, I've got, of course, many articles up there, Perry's Perennial pages, perrysperennials.info, and later this fall, more about our next garden tour ah. next summer, which will be in June to Maine. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Leonard Perry and Ann Hanselrick, thank you so much for coming in and sharing Thanks. such great information <laughs> with us. And thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard.